So, um, the question here is whether it's possible that we be the conscious beings that we are and yet be wholly physical. This is an old problem in philosophy, whether the mind, and in particular consciousness, can be accounted for in a physicalistic or a materialistic way. Um, now, before the 20th century, most people agreed that materialism was false. The idea was that mentality is, in fact, non-physical. But especially in the last 50 or 60 years, the prevalence of opinion has been that we're wholly physical beings, and in some sense, our minds are just our brains. But yet, there's a very important problem for this view that comes from consciousness, because we have emotions that are conscious, we have sensations that are conscious. Now, um, for example, you might smell a rose, for example. There's a certain um, way it's like to smell a rose, right? Now, is that particular sensation that you have, can that be physical? Can that be a physical thing? And some people argue, no, there's no way that can be physical because um, no matter how much you knew about the brain, there's no way you could know, just by virtue of knowing what you know about the brain, what it's like to smell a rose, right? So that physical knowledge won't give you that knowledge of consciousness, of the conscious state, okay? That's sometimes called the epistemic gap, okay? So the worry is that no matter how much you knew about the physical, you still won't know everything there is to know about consciousness. Right? So, um, can that gap be bridged? And that's the mind-body problem, or the problem for physicalism about consciousness, as people nowadays think about it. Now, um, in my own work, um, I explore a couple of different ways to try to solve the mind-body problem for physicalism. Now, I'm not sure that physicalism is true, and I have a book in which I present a couple of different possible routes that the physicalist might take. Now, it seems to me that uh, one way of putting the worry is this. It doesn't seem as if consciousness is physical. Consciousness, as we introspect it, doesn't seem physical. So in order to save physicalism, um, maybe one of the following two theses has to be true. That maybe consciousness isn't what it seems. And it's different from how it seems. The other possibility is that physical isn't what it seems. It's different from what it seems. So, Maybe, um, on the first possibility, there are some other things in the world that aren't as they seem. For example, colors. The contemporary view about colors is what? That colors are something like molecular shapes, right? Uh, so what is redness? Redness seems a certain way to us in visual experience, but color science tells us that, you know, there's a spectral reflectance profile and it's molecular basis, and maybe redness is the molecular basis for, the, for a certain kind of spectral reflectance profile. Okay, so, conscious, so redness is different from how it seems. Now, if redness can be different from how it seems, according to modern science, why can't the smell of a rose be different from how it seems? Now, you might think that's too crazy, because... But Kant, Immanuel Kant, actually suggested this. He said, maybe, you know, even our mental states aren't how they appear to us in introspective experience. So that's one possibility that... Um, it's a kind of crazy possibility, it seems, because we think that if anything is as it seems, is as it appears, it's our experiences. For example, you feel happy. How could happiness not be exactly as it appears? You think, well, maybe it isn't. Well, maybe it's, there's a kind of gap between the way happiness is and the way it appears to us in introspection, so that happiness can be physical. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the physical is a little stranger than we ordinarily think it is. And so David Chalmers, for example, has suggested that maybe the physical um, includes consciousness. Maybe the very most fundamental particles in the universe are, have little bits of consciousness in them. This is an old theory called panpsychism, that you know, the physical world, uh, at its very basic level, um, is, is conscious. I think that's kind of an odd position myself. It's not one that I like. But another position that David Chalmers suggests is this. Maybe there are properties that science doesn't talk about that physical things have that account for consciousness. Right? They account for consciousness. And maybe if we knew what those properties were like, or had a really clear conception of what those properties were like, then those physical things could account for consciousness, despite the fact that right now it doesn't seem as if that's possible. So those are two possibilities for physicalism that I explore. Okay? One according to which consciousness is different from how it seems and so it can be physical. Another according to which the physical is, is fancier or different from how it seems. And so, 
it can account for consciousness. So how do contemporary philosophers and maybe contemporary neuroscientists try to solve this problem? So the first view that I outlined is sometimes called um, a version of eliminationism. So that view says that consciousness isn't quite what it seems and we want to eliminate from our picture of consciousness certain features of it that are troublesome for physicalism. Okay? And so Daniel Dennett, for example, has a view like that. Um, Paul and Patricia Churchland have advocated a view like that. Now, someone like David Chalmers finds that unsatisfying because he thinks it's very likely that consciousness is just as it seems. So here's another view that's, that's current. It's called uh, integrated information theory. Uh, so um, Giulio Tononi uh, has, has developed this. He's an Italian neuroscientist. Um, and in his view, what consciousness, what accounts for consciousness, or the most important factor for accounting for consciousness is just the degree with which information is integrated in our brains. And it turns out it's massively integrated, much, much more integrated than uh, the information in our best computers is integrated. Okay? So uh, maybe our brains are very special uh, in that they have an extremely high degree of integration of information. So here's a possibility that you can somehow combine the information integration theory with maybe some of this idea that consciousness isn't quite what it seemed. Maybe if you put those two theories together somehow, you're going to be able to come up with a scientific account of consciousness. At least that's a hope. Okay? So, but quite a few people think that the information integration theory is a, is a real possibility for an account of consciousness, and there's quite a lot of excitement about it in, on the contemporary scene. So you might wonder whether philosophers and neuroscientists can cooperate on a science of consciousness. And one of the older views has been this, that neuroscience really operates independently of philosophy. Neuroscientists study the brain, and if an account of consciousness comes out of neuroscience, that's a good thing. Uh, but from the point of view, view of neuroscience, maybe it's best to ignore the kinds of mind-body problems that philosophers raise. But an interesting fact about in, information integration theory is that it is a collaborative project. Just uh, a couple of months ago, I was at a seminar at um, New York University on information integration theory, and it, it featured neuroscientists like Tononi and Christoph Koch. It uh, featured um, physicists who work on the mathematics of integrated information, computer scientists who work on um, in integrated information from the computer science perspective, and quite a few philosophers. And it turned out to be wonderfully collaborative. Okay? So I think that each of the different groups had something important to communicate to the others. And the result was um, kind of a deeper understanding of the possibilities for this theory uh, insofar as it might account for consciousness. So I do think that um, there's been a kind of a change in um, um, the science of consciousness recently, that there's more of a tendency toward collaboration on a science of consciousness than there has been in the past. And I think this is a very good thing.